quantum F bad in the uh, second quantum computing co uh, colloquium of the TeamNet project. Uh, it's uh, my name is Michal Schmeinitz, and I will be your host today. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. We have a privilege to, to, to host Jordan Kotler from Harvard University. So uh, Jordan is a prolific scientist working in the intersection of quantum information theory, many body physics, high energy physics, black hole physics, even about latter topics I know not that much uh, myself, but today uh, Jordan will be talking about uh, um, some interesting line of research he was, uh, let's say, involved in that concern, uh, let's say, combining complexity theory and uh, exper ex experiments or like complexity of experiments. So in the past, Jordan uh, wrote those two interesting papers, one with Frank Vilcek called Quantum Overlapping Tomography, that is about like how you would officially measure many local observables at the same time. And also this, this, this beautiful long paper that was recently published in Nature Communications, uh, uh, I think it's quantum called Quantum Algorithmic Measurements. Uh, it's with Dorit Akronov uh, and, and uh, he actually is the first, I guess it's, it's the first paper that is referenced there. So those, those works somehow like bring uh, complexity theory and uh, sampling complexity considerations uh, kind of uh, they, they emphasize it that it's relevant for the near-term quantum computers. And uh, so today, Jordan will be talking about uh, some follow-up works to those uh, uh, yeah, projects. So it's a great uh, pleasure to have you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jordan, for agreeing to give this talk. And uh, the, the screen is yours. Just one uh, technical comment. So. Uh, the, the talk will last probably around one hour, like, uh, and then we'll have some session of, like, discussion session afterwards. But if you want to ask questions, like, maybe please raise hand and then you can ask a question. Please, Jordan. Well, thank you for that very nice introduction and for giving me the opportunity to speak. And of course, feel free to ask questions throughout in, in the manner that was described. So I'm going to tell you about a series of works uh, over the last few years, a, a large chunk of it done during the pandemic, but some more recent. And the basic subject of this talk is the quantum complexity of experiments. And I'll explain what I mean both by quantum complexity and also what I mean by it in the context of experiments. So let's begin this talk with a question, namely, what is an experiment? This seems like a simple enough question. As physicists, or even more broadly as scientists, we feel like we have an intuitive sense of what it means to perform an experiment or what an experiment is. But if we think about the sheer variety of ex experimental protocols and, a, and, and the litany of what we can learn when, by doing an experiment, it actually becomes less obvious what the answer is to this question. So let me give some examples to illustrate the point. Some examples of what we can learn by doing an experiment include measuring constants of nature, such as the speed of light or the charge of an electron, quantifying dynamical properties, such as the rate of a chemical reaction, or inferring structural properties like the symmetry group of a crystal, or learning more abstract information. For instance, the chain of chemical reactions that comprise photosynthesis, or whether Yang Mills describes the strong force. With the sheer variety of examples in mind and many more that I did not list, it really emphasizes that we should ask, what exactly is an experiment in its full scope of generality? Now, part of the goal of this talk is to be able to, and these works that I cited at the beginning, is to make a, a precise answer to this question, is to formulate this question in the language of computer science, and in particular, quantum information and quantum uh, computational complexity theory. In so doing, we can bring to bear the tools of these subjects to constrain the resources that are required to perform experiments and to have more of a computational viewpoint on what an experiment actually is. So there have been some recent perspectives on this question. Uh, one, due to Huang Kung and Preskill in, uh, in last year, in which they stipulated that many experiments can be thought of as quantum learning algorithms, which learn properties of partially uncharacterized systems via examples. So this is a pretty intuitive perspective on what an experiment is. It's saying that 
An experiment is a type of learning algorithm where we learn about properties of nature by interacting with nature. A complementary point of view uh, is, uh, was in this paper at around the same time by myself, Dorit Aharonov and Xiaoyang Shi, in which we posited that all experiments are examples of what we call quantum algorithmic measurements, abbreviated as QALMS, which are a hybrid of black box algorithms and interactive protocol. It's a, a broader formalization of, uh, of what we mean by an experiment. These works built off of previous works in the context of uh, interactive protocols and quantum information. So I would like to, in this talk, draw out the distinction between two particular types of experiments, one which I will call conventional experiments, the other which I will call quantum enhanced experiments. So, so let me tell you what I mean by this. So let me first draw out a formalization of what I mean by conventional experiment. And the thing that we should have in our head when I say this is all experiments that are done in say 20th century physics uh, and even most experiments up until the current day, what we mean by an ordinary experiment. So let's abstract this into three different subsystems. We have the nature system, which is the system that we wish to understand or interrogate via our experimentation. We have the lab system, which is our apparatus that is going to couple to nature. And then we have our classical memory, which is our computational resources. So we can think about nature as some experimental sample. Here I've shown a picture of graphing. This is the system we would like to understand. We have our lab system, which again is the apparatus, which can directly couple to the nature system. And then our classical memory we can regard as our laptop. Our laptop doesn't directly couple to the nature system, but it allows us to, uh, but, but it does in fact communicate with our apparatus and can uh, do post-processing and pre-processing on uh, various kinds of uh, measurement data. So what is the modus operandi of an, ex of, uh, of an experiment? What, is, what does a protocol look like? Well, what we would do is that we can program into our classical computer uh, what measurements we wish to make using our apparatus. So our uh, computer tells our apparatus how it should couple to our experimental system. And in turn, our experimental system imprints uh, information on the apparatus, which then can be uh, decohered and measured. And then the classical information can then be sent to our computer for further processing. Now, this can this can proceed in a loop, we can use the outcomes of previous me measurement results to inform the measurements that we make in the future, and so on and so forth. However, in a conventional experiment, the information that is transmitted between our classical computational apparatus and our measurement apparatus is all classical information, that we have a classical computer which tells, which provides classical information to the apparatus as to what and how it should measure. And the information that we get from the apparatus to the computer is itself classical. Namely, when we measure a quantum system, we usually fully decohere it, or rather the, uh, the classical me the measurement apparatus has imprints of only classical data inside of it that we can access. And this is the information that we are then going to process on our computer. Now, let me contrast this with a more interesting possibility, which superficially looks similar. We have nature in the lab, but now we have the possibility of a quantum memory which we can think of maybe more appropriately is a full-fledged quantum computer. So here we still have our graphing, we have our experimental apparatus, but now we have a full-fledged quantum computer. And what's different about this type of experiment is that now uh, we do not mandate that the, that the information that is transmitted between our, our computer and our apparatus, we don't require it to be classical, it can be fully quantum. So again, we can take quantum memory, so we can take quantum information that we've stored in the quantum computer and use it to inform our apparatus as to what it should measure. And moreover, uh, when the uh, samples, when our experimental samples couple to the apparatus, we're not forced to fully decohere it. In other words, we can perform partial measurements and store quantum data in the quantum computer and also proceed adaptively. So the difference between the conventional experiment and the quantum enhanced experiment is that we allow for the possibility that we can perform quantum processing on quantum data and moreover, that we can store quantum information in our quantum computer uh, to aid in our uh, experimental design. The basic question which we would like to contend with or is the question of the power of quantum enhancement. So there's a question, do there exist kinds of experiments in which you would strongly benefit from having a quantum computer in your lab that can interface 
with an experimental sample. That is, are there kinds of experiments for which quantum enhanced experiments significantly beat out what a conventional experiment can do? What we establish in these works is that the answer is yes. There exist experiments with an exponential complexity separation between conventional and quantum enhanced settings. That is, there exist certain experiments for which having a quantum computer in the lab is exponentially advantageous. You have to make exponentially fewer measurements and rounds of measurements more broadly in order to learn what it is that you want to learn about nature. So there are two parts to establishing this. Um, sorry, Jordan, just a question. So by complexity here, you mean uh, something like number of samples you need to, like number of times you need to query nature or do you mean the number of gates one has to implement? So uh, let's say for the moment, uh, I mean the sense of query complexity, which is the number of measurements that I require to make about nature. But so many of the bounds that I'm going to discuss are information theoretic in nature, in the sense that they don't rely on computational complexity theory directly. So we can get them unconditionally. But we would like, ideally, whatever protocols we find, we would like the quantum enhanced protocols not just to be query efficient, but to be gate efficient. Namely, we would not, if we have an efficient protocol, it should mean that not only do we have to make a small number of measurements, but also that the operations that we would like to perform are actually doable, i.e. low complexity. Thanks. Sure. So there's two parts to this endeavor of establishing the power of quantum enhancement. On the one hand, we need to show that a particular experiment can be performed efficiently with a quantum computer, both in the sense of number of measurements and the operations which we perform, or in the technical parlance of complexity theory, we would like it to be query and gate efficient. But we would also like to show that the experiment is exponentially hard in the conventional setting, uh, namely that no matter what we do, uh, we, we, we simply do not have an efficient way of performing the protocol if we do not have access to a quantum computer. Now, this first part is comparatively easier. All we have to do is exhibit one efficient quantum enhanced experiment. If I uh, give you a potential experiment and I said, okay, can we do it with a quantum computer? If the answer is yes, then to, to demonstrate this to you, I just need to give you one example in which it works. The second however, this showing that the experiment is exponentially hard in the conventional setting, well, this is difficult because you have to rule out the possibility of all efficient conventional experiments. Now, this is particularly difficult because the conventional experiments can employ adaptive strategies. That is, that they can leverage experiments that we've performed in the past to inform the measurements that we perform in the future. And it's very difficult at a technical level to rule out that this doesn't help you in some way. So a lot of the technical meat of what I've developed over the last few years with my collaborators is how to do this second part, uh, namely how to rule out that conventional experiments can perform certain kinds of tasks efficiently. And I will describe in some detail how this works. There has been some recent work also uh, making overtures in this direction, namely exponential separations and gate and query complexity for learning properties of classical oracles. Uh, and exponential separations and query complexity for learning poly observables. And in this work with Aharonov, myself, and she, exponential separations and gate and query complexity for learning properties of quantum states and channels. So the work that I'm going to tell you about is really a synthesis of, uh, has grown out of the synthesis of three different works. One is a paper by Bubek, Chen, and Lee on the so-called problem of mixedness testing, which I'll talk about a variation of in a bit. This paper I mentioned by Huang Kung and Preskel, and this paper by uh, Dorita Harona, myself, and Xiaoliang Shi. So this, the works that I'm going to tell you provide a new framework for proving exponential lower bounds for protocols with classical memories. That is, it, it establishes that certain kinds of protocols in the conventional experimental setting are exponentially inefficient no matter what you do. And this allows us to prove new exponential complexity separations between interactive protocols with and without quantum memories, that is between conventional experiments and quantum enhanced experiments. So let's consider a particular class of problems, uh, uh, some toy problems, which are going to orient the discussion. These will be exponential separations and learning properties of quantum states. So let's first consider the problem of purity testing. So here's the task at hand. Suppose that I task you with distinguishing between, on the one hand, the maximally mixed state, and on the other hand, a fixed Haar random pure state. So here's what we should imagine. Suppose that I have a quantum source, which each time I push a button, it outputs an n qubit quantum state. 
And suppose that every time that I query this source, either the state which is provided to me is always the maximally mixed state, or it is always a fixed par random pure state. That is, uh, a state is chosen randomly from the space of uh, n qubit uh, pure states with the uniform distribution. And that random state, that same random state is fed to me every single time I query it. Now the maximally mixed state, of course, is by definition a state which is completely mixed. It's a state with high entropy, uh, whereas the, har, the, har random, the fixed har random pure state is low entropy. It's a, it's a pure state, it's zero entropy. So what, I'm, what we're interested in this task is being able to distinguish between whether you receive a, 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 a very decohered, very mixed state or a, a, or a pure fixed state. So a theorem uh, due to, in this paper with Aharonov and Xi, is that the complexity in the setting that you have a quantum memory of performing purity testing on n qubits, this is just a fancy way of saying in the quantum enhanced setting, how efficiently can you do this? Well, the answer is that the number of measurements which you require is order one. Um, essentially what you do is that you perform a swap test. If you take two copies of your state, you can easily check what the purity is uh, and uh, the purities between the a maximum mixed state is very small and for a Pure state, of course, the purity is one. So it's very easy to distinguish between the two possibilities. But what that requires is doing, uh, you really kind of need a quantum computer to do this because you have to do interferometry on two copies of, of, uh, of a many body quantum state. By contrast, in the conventional measurement setting in which you only have a classical memory or a classical computer, uh, then, it, then you require exponentially many measurements in order to distinguish the two possibilities. So that is a lower bound of exponentially many measurements. So this shows an enormous separation between what you can do with a quantum computer and what you can do with a classical computer. And we'll talk about more what this means shortly. And the proof of this classical lower bound is in the original paper is about 20 pages. It's a pretty complicated proof. Um, but in the new works that I'm going to tell you about, the, we can reduce the proof of this classical lower bound to a half a page. In fact, it's so simple. Uh, that I can explain to you precisely uh, how it works. And now in this new work, we actually have asymptotically tight uh, uh, bound. So here in the classical memory setting, we require at least two to the n over two measurements in order to distinguish between these two possibilities. But we also require at most two to the n over two measurements. Namely, we can find a protocol in the classical setting uh, or the conventional setting, which actually saturates the bound. So let me tell you now the basic framework by which we prove this. We call it the learning tree framework. And I'll particularly, in particular tell you how you do it for learning states. So suppose we have a physical source which produces a state row, namely an object, we push a button, we get out an n qubit state row. And we want to learn about it in the setting without a quantum memory. Namely, we would like to learn about, we would like to think about this in the conventional experimental setting. So what's a model for how this works? So Suppose that we obtain a copy of rho and we measure it using a rank one POVM. Now, let's not worry so much why it's a rank one POVM. We can suppose for the sake of this discussion that this is just a projective measurement. Um, namely that these BIs form a complete orthonormal basis of states and we are measuring in this BI basis. Now, when we measure the state, suppose that the output is Q. Namely, when we, when we measure rho in this basis, we obtain the outcome B sub Q. That's what we measure, say. And we store the index Q in the classical memory. So, okay, so we performed a measurement in this basis and we get some classical outcome. We've measured it to be in B sub Q and we store the outcome Q, which, which labels the measurement outcome. Now, in the next round, uh, we obtain another copy of rho and we can measure it using a different complete orthonormal basis, BQI. Now here what's interesting is that we have now chosen a basis which is contingent on the previous measurement outcome. That is, this is an adaptive choice of basis that we are using the information that we have gained in our previous measurement round to determine how we are going to measure in the future. Now suppose that the outcome of this measurement is R. That is, we measure rho to be in the state B sub Q R and we store R in the classical memory. I'll do one more example. Suppose we obtain a copy of rho again, we measure it using, again, a new orthonormal basis, B sub QRI, which depends on both of the previous measurement outcomes. 
And suppose that the output is S, namely that we measure it to be in state BQRS and we store S in the classical memory and so on and so forth. So this is a framework for an adaptive measurement protocol. Excuse me. Yes. What is what we assume about source? Is it stable, stationary? Because this is very important in this context, yes? If you sense, for example, the, the separate stance and the state and so on, it's some, some uh, non-stable source, we produce some problems, yes? Because and so we, in fact, we, we need an ideal resource. In yes. So, so let's assume for, okay, so in the simplest setting, we, let's first imagine the idealized setting in which we are really getting the same copy of row each time. Now, of course, if you take an unidealized source, you can still imagine it as, uh, you know, how do I say, if, if the manner in which it deviates from moment to moment is probabilistic, then we can encapsulate that into a particular choice of density matrix, as long as there's no drift as a function of time. But, but let's just suppose for simplicity, for the sake of this explanation, that it's some idealized source in which we're just getting the same state row each time. And later we can come back, we can discuss the question of what happens if the source has, has error, has noise, has drift, and, and, and so on. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So, but a basic mathematical question is how do we conceptualize, how do we visualize or formalize this idea of an adaptive protocol? Well, the way to imagine this is as a type of tree. So in, in this protocol, the way we think about it is that we start here. And in the first round of the protocol, we measure in some basis. Suppose that the outcome that we, uh, of, of measuring in this first round in this basis here is that we measure B2. Now, contingent on having measured B2, we then decide to measure in a new basis, which is given by this, these branching forks of the tree. And maybe in the next round, we measure it in state B21, which leads to another forking of the tree, and so on and so forth. The idea here is that we can imagine an adaptive protocol as a type of learning tree, in which our trajectory through the, through the tree, you know, maybe we go to B1, we go to B12, and so on and so forth, corresponds to our sequence of measurement outcomes in the protocol. Now, what the fact that it's a tree accounts for the fact that the protocol is adaptive. If we measure a particular outcome, this leads to a new um, branching of the tree in which we measure in a basis which, uh, which corresponds to uh, whatever we have previously measured. So by going down the path through the tree, we trace out a particular trajectory of a protocol, which we could have an adaptive protocol, which we have performed. So as I said, a particular instantiation of the protocol is a path through the tree, specifically a root to leaf path through the tree. This is called the root of the tree. The very bottom of the tree are called the leaves. And a tree of depth T, namely where we have T rounds or, or T layers, corresponds to measuring T copies of the state and sequence. So each of these layers corresponds to a particular measurement round if there are T layers and there are T measurement rounds. So let V naught through V T minus one be a root to leaf path through the tree. That is let these label vertices of the tree where we start here and then we traverse the tree through a particular measurement protocol. Now the probability of taking that particular path is I'll call it the probability if we keep getting the state row each time of taking this particular uh, path through the tree is going to be this product. It's the product that when we uh, are at the particular vertex V sub T, which corresponds to this basis element. Well, this is the probability that we measure rho to be in this basis element. And it's the product over all such basis elements over this particular root to leaf path through the tree. So it said in a different way, this is the probability that in the first round, we measure it to be in v, uh, B sub V1. And in the second round, we measure it to be in B V2 and so on and so forth. This is the probability of a particular sequence of measurement outcomes if we receive the state row each time that we query the, uh, the quantum source. Now, if instead we received the state sigma each time we query the quantum source, well, it would be the same formula, except all of the rows would be replaced with sigmas. Now, what we would like to do, if we would like to say that it's difficult to distinguish between rho and sigma, then it's the case that we should bound 
the difference between these two probability distributions, in this case, in the total variation distance or the one norm. We would like to show that if you perform this adaptive protocol, that the measurement outcomes which you get, which are encoded in these probability distributions are extremely close to one another. That when you perform the sequence of measurement outcomes, you can't really tell the difference between getting the state rho each time and, versus, and getting the state sigma each time. Now, at a technical level, the way that we bound this is by two different proof strategies. One we call the edge-based strategies, in which we bound the information the learner can gain by traversing any edge in the tree. At an intuitive level, what this means is that each part any particular round of the experimental protocol, you don't learn much information. There's another kind of strategy which we employ, which we call the path-based strategy. And which it could be the case that in some rounds of the experiment, you do gain a lot of information. And in other rounds, uh, in other measurement rounds, you gain less information. So in the path-based strategy, we bound the information gain for traversing an entire path through the tree as opposed to any particular step uh, of, of, the, of, of the measurement protocol. So let me tell you what the upshot is all, all of this. So let's again go back to the problem uh, or the initial problem, which I stated, in which we would like to distinguish between receiving on the one hand a maximally mixed state uh, each time we query the source. And on the other hand, a fixed har random pure state. And I claim to you that uh, that it's exponentially hard to do this if you're only, you know, if you can only do these adaptive uh, measurement protocols. Let me show you brief, let me sketch the proof before we go to some other results. So here's a proof of this exponential lower bound in the conventional measurement setting in which we only have access to a classical memory. So let V naught through V T minus one be a root to leaf path through the tree, then the probability of taking that path, if we receive the maximum mixed it in n qubits each time, is uniform. It's one over two to the nt. That is, because it's a maximum mixed state, uh, any sequence of measurement outcomes will happen with equal probability because uh, it's, it's an isotropic distribution over the space of states. Now, by contrast, if we have a fixed har random pure state, then we should take the product uh, over our our, uh, our root to leaf path through the tree, our sequence of measurement outcomes. And here's the probability that we go through a series of measurement outcomes. And on the outside, we should average over the hard distribution. Uh, namely, we should average over the possibility of which uh, fixed hard random state we are receiving. What we would like to do is to show that these two distributions are close to one another, that we cannot distinguish between the possibility of getting the maximum mixed state each time or the fixed uh, or the fixed pure state each time. Let me just briefly tell you how this works because the proof is not particularly complicated. This is the quantity which we wish to bound. There's a simple identity in which we can, this is an equality in which we can trade uh, this one norm distance, this total variation distance with, with this. Um, if we sum only over the paths for which the probability of the, uh, uh, of, uh, of a particular set of measurement outcomes receiving the mixed state is greater than that of the pure state, then we can remove the absolute values and the factor of half uh, and just giving us these ordinary brackets, just parentheses. This is just a sum with, with, no, with no absolute values. This is a simple identity that one can prove. And then if we factor out the mixed, then what we would like to show is that this quantity is small. If this quantity is small, namely if this ratio is close to one, then this entire sum will be very small and it will be difficult to distinguish between the mixed and pure uh, versions of the protocol. So in short, if we write out this ratio, we can evaluate it by using some, uh, you know, by, by essentially performing this expectation value and some simple bounds end up establishing that, uh, that the number of measurements which we require in order to get this to be large, namely to get this difference to be order one, is that the number of measurements t has to be greater than two to the n over two. So what that means is that if we don't want this to be exponentially small, if we, in other words, if we would like this to be order one so that we can distinguish between the two possibilities, we require exponentially many measurements in the number of qubits in order to do so. So this is a brief sketch of how the proof works. So let me tell you some other versions of this. We'll get progressively more uh, realistic. And um, sorry, Jordan, and just some some questions. Uh, um, so I guess everything generalizes if you do general POVMs. Uh, and... Yes. So um, even though I have talked about projective measurements, um, 
so any POVM can be refined into a rank one POVM. So if you prove it as we do for the case of rank one POVMs, that's sufficient. And, and that is what we did. And uh, right, but okay. Uh, and I guess you exclude also the possibility to implement some instruments that is to say like some, just some weak measurements. Uh, you don't, yeah. Yeah, so um, in the conventional experiments, the assumption as it is with ordinary experiments is that when you have your quantum system, you have to basically completely measure it before you can reprepare it. Um, so in other words, we're not allowing for the possibility of making a partial measurement in which, um, or how do I say, uh, you can make as many partial measurements as you want, but the problem is that you can only get a new copy of the state after, you're, after you've completely decohered it. That's, that's, the, that's the model. Which, in fact, is how ordinary experiments work. <laughs> so let me give you another example. Um, suppose we're given a density matrix of the form identity plus epsilon times a polystring over 2 to the n, where p is some polystring. So this is some family of quantum states. And what's nice about these quantum states is that they can be readily prepared by low-depth quantum circuits. And if I give you such a state and I don't tell you what p is, the question is, can you determine p? This is a certain kind of problem in which now we have a whole family of states. We're not just trying to distinguish between two possibilities. We're trying to distinguish between uh, exponentially many possibilities where we would like to determine the kind of state that we have. So a result in this paper with uh, Satan Chen, Robert Huang, and Jerry Lee from this last year is that uh, if you have a full-fledged quantum computer, you can perform this task in order n measurements but uh, up to log factors, if you, in the uh, conventional setting, you require exponentially, measure, exponentially many measurements in order to do so. So this is a more sophisticated proof. Um, and it turns out that a variation of this task is gate efficient with a quantum memory. So you can actually do this task in practice. So let me just make a conceptual point. The previous example, which I gave you, was about distinguishing between a maximally mixed state and a fixed Haar random pure state. Now, the problem with that is that the Haar random pure state is exponentially hard to prepare. So it's, this, that's the previous problem that I told you is a toy problem. It's not a realistic problem because actually preparing the samples, uh, you know, it, 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 you, you couldn't actually do it. But in this case, what's interesting here is that you can actually prepare these kinds of states. These states can be prepared by essentially constant depth circuits. So this is an example for which you have a family of states which are easy to prepare but are hard to distinguish using only conventional experiments, but are easy to distinguish with quantum enhanced experiments. Um, sorry, Jordan, if you, can you elaborate like how those states are like, I would naively prepare them probabilistically just, you know. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, probability implement, uh, well, the, yeah, okay. Just, I would do some random gates uh, and then statistically I will get such states. So, but like what, what is the approach that you guys take here? Yeah, it's, it, that's basically right. I mean, the, the point is that, I mean, it's easiest to see this when epsilon equals one, but you can see it otherwise too. Th these are basically just um, classical mixtures of product states. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's the key point. So it's basically what you said. Okay. So just to make one comment, I mean, it's sort of surprising that different classical mixtures of product states are hard to mutually distinguish. It's sort of surprising because they seem pretty simple, but but they're actually hard to distinguish. Okay, so let me give another when example. You, when you think about it, you can, sometimes it's hard to distinguish just uh, uh, things that are uh, like states that are in the same computational basis, right? Because uh, for sure. some specific. Right, some mixtures in a sense. Sure, but I mean, uh, it turns out that it's hard to distinguish, say, the epsilon equals one from the epsilon equals zero case. Like they're all hard to distinguish, even from the maximum. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, great. Okay, so let me give another example, more apropos to questions about learning theory, machine, machine learning, about quantum principle component analysis. Okay, so, so this, let's, this requires a little bit of unpacking. Suppose I give you an unknown state rho, a density matrix, where its top eigenvector is phi. So in other words, we take rho, we diagonalize rho, and we look at its top eigenvalue, 
and its associated eigenvector is phi. Now suppose that the gap between its top eigenvalue and its second to top eigenvalue is constant. Uh, it turns out that it can be polynomially small in n, that's also fine. And suppose what we, what we desire to do is to extract the top eigenvector and to compute its expectation value to within constant error of some simple operator, for example, the poly z operator on the first qubit. So this is like a quantum version of principal component analysis. We have this matrix. We want to extract its leading principal component. In the quantum case, we're just saying compute some simple expectation value. What's interesting is that this quantum PCA task, OK, well, it's easy to do this if you have a full-fledged quantum computer. You can use the quantum PCA algorithm, which was developed a number of years ago. But what's surprising is that in the, in the conventional setting, you, you require exponentially many measurements in order to do this task. So that this is to say that for this quantum version of principal component analysis, uh, you know, learning features about the leading principal component of a quantum state, it's easy to do on a quantum computer, but it's exponentially hard for certain classes of states on a class uh, using this more conventional uh, um, experimental setting. So that that's an interest. It's a kind of conceptually interesting separation, and really shows that about the power of certain kinds of quantum machine learning techniques, specifically on quantum data, you can regard Rho as a type of quantum data which we're trying to understand. So, so far I've mostly been talking about uh, exponential separations and learning features of quantum states, but we could also think about dynamics or more generally, you know, learning features of quantum channels. So let me talk about that. Let me talk about what I'll call the symmetry distinction problem. So the intuition is that it's difficult to determine the symmetry classes of a strongly interacting quantum many body system. So this is something that you would want to do as a condensed matter physicist, you're given some quantum many body system, and you would like to ascertain what its symmetries are. Now, this is in general a hard thing to do if you don't know how to characterize your system. So let's formulate a toy model in which this can be made precise. So first, let's recall the time reversal symmetry classes of unitaries. So three different kinds of unitaries include the ordinary unitaries, in which the inverse of the unitary is its conjugate transpose, the orthogonal class, in which uh, the how do I say in which the um, in which the inverse of a unitary is simply its transpose, and then maybe the lesser lesser utilized symplectic class in which the inverse of a unitary is its symplectic transpose. If this is not familiar to you, don't worry so much about it. But th these realize three different forms of time reversal symmetry. So the question that we would like to ask is, suppose that I have a black box which either implements a fixed Haar random unitary. So each time I pass this feed a state, you know, each time I query it, it applies some uh, unitary to my system. And either that unitary is always uh, a Haar random ordinary unitary, a fixed Haar random orthogonal matrix, or a fixed Haar random symplectic matrix. So in other words, it's going to apply the same unitary each time, but I don't know which of these three symmetry classes it belongs to. And my, my task is to figure out which of these three is instantiated. So a result from this paper with Dorit and Xiaoyang, which was later uh, generalized in, in quite a substantial way in this paper with Chen Huang and Li, is that if you have a quantum computer, you can actually distinguish between these three possibilities with order one measurements. But in the conventional measurement setting, you require exponentially many measurements to do so. So this is an example for which in a conventional experiment in which you can make only these adaptive measurements that decohere the system, it requires X. So this is the way that we currently do experiments in, in the real world. Um, it requires exponentially many measurements to, to determine the symmetry class but if you have a quantum computer, you can actually do it extremely efficiently. Uh, now, the protocol with the quantum memory is actually also gate efficient, so you can do it in practice. So in fact, a, a toy version of this experiment was actually done recently in collaboration with various people at Google Quantum AI. Let me tell you what we did. We, what we did was that we, we had a random quantum circuit uh, modestly low depth, but that's what you can do in practice these days. Um, it's, it was either a unitary circuit or an orthogonal circuit. So it was either built out of unitary matrices or orthogonal matrices. What we did was um, we, we either analyze, what we did was that we prepared some state, we applied 
the um, uh, either this black box circuit, which was either a unitary or orthogonal circuit, and then we get some measurement outcome and we and we make some measurements on it. What we did is that we compared this in the quantum and classical settings using uh, in, in, in using some unsupervised learning techniques. So in other words, we made a series of measurements uh, in the quantum, in the conventional setting and in the quantum enhanced setting using the Google quantum computer uh, for a toy model of this problem. And we found that in the quantum enhanced setting that we could in fact tell the difference between this, these unitary matrices and these uh, orthogonal matrices, whereas in the conventional setting, we could not tell the difference between them. This also works not just for one dimensional dynamics. So you can look at unitaries on a one dimensional lattice, but we also did it for two dimensional dynamics with a qualitatively similar result. Uh, maybe for now I'll spare you the details of how this was implemented on the Sycamore processor, but, uh, but anyway, but um, the point is at least the conceptual level uh, that these results actually bear out in practice for uh, experimentally realizable systems. For, yeah. um, sorry, can I ask, so for, because for quantum states, you had uh, examples of uh, experimentally, let's say feasible, okay, like instances when you do have this expo exponential separation between yes. uh, uh, like classical and quantum memory. So, but for uh, channels, for unitaries, do you have something like this? I, um... Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I will talk, by the way, in the next few minutes about uh, an experiment that was done. Okay, so as you're pointing out, the, the theorem that I just proved on the previous slide was about Haar random unitaries, which is maybe as you're observing are not efficient to prepare. So what this experiment did was this experiment, in fact, uh, is not implied by the, the results of this experiment are not implied by the theorem because this is about low depth random quantum circuits, which we don't know how to prove statements about. So this, this is just uh, corroborates the results at a qualitative level, says that even for low depth quantum circuits, it's apparently hard in practice to distinguish between the two possibilities. But in fact, uh, in the quantum state setting, um, I'll show you an experiment in which the states are efficiently preparable, and we also did the experiment, and for which the theorem really does have something to say about the experiment. Uh, sure, but just coming now, that, that's that's great. But just theoretically, you you don't have examples oh. of gates uh, for which yeah, I mean, if they were prepared, like I mean, efficiently to prepare those channels, and you do have the separation. Yeah, so it is the case, it is an open question in this subject as to whether there's an exponential separation between uh, the, the conventional and quantum enhanced setting for a channel which is efficiently preparable. Uh, mm -hmm. there, are no, there are no known examples. Um, how do I say it? There are no known non-trivial examples. I'll give you an example of a trivial example. Um, suppose you have a channel which takes your state uh, it throws it away and then it replaces it with one of these I plus P states that I told you before. <laughs> if you just reduce essentially to the to the state distinction case, then okay, you can sort of trivially get an example sure. of how much sufficient to prepare. But but for a particular definition, you know, okay, but in the genuine case where you're really dealing with the channel, not a state problem, we do not know of any examples. And that's an interesting open question. I believe it's possible, it's just sort of technically difficult. Uh, thanks. Sure. So now let me tell you about something which is a little bit conceptually different, but I, that I find particularly fascinating, which is exponential separations with bounded quantum memory. So, so let me say what this means. So, so far what we've been considering is the distinction between what I called conventional experiments and quantum enhanced experiments. In the latter case for quantum enhanced experiments, we have a quantum computer with a full fledged, with a quantum memory where we can store and process quantum data. What I'd like to think about now is a different kind of question, which is suppose you have a quantum computer in your lab. Let's take that for granted. But that the number of qubits you have of your quantum computer is limited in some fashion, that you only have a limited number of qubits. The question I want to know is, um, what are the kinds of things you can do with a quantum computer with a limited number of qubits? And how do the kinds of tasks you can perform with a quantum computer depend on the number of qubits you have? In other words, is it the case that uh, there are certain experiments which I can do really efficiently with 50 qubits that would be extremely inefficient with 25 qubits? How would we prove something like that? That's what I'm going to show you next. I, I like to conceptualize this as a space-time trade-off in, in, in the following manner. So let, let me state the problem and then I'll draw some pictures to show you what I mean. The question, as I said, is what is the power of a quantum computer with a bounded number of qubits? Quite interesting theoretical question. 
So let me give you a model experiment. I'll, I'll just state the informal version of it. Okay, this is a lot, lot of text, but when I draw the picture, it'll make more sense. Suppose the experiment, experimentalist is given access to copies of an n qubit state row for an amount of time t, after which they are asked to output the expectation value of the absolute value of trace of O against row. The basic question is how much time t is needed to succeed? Okay, so, so drawing the picture will make this make a lot more sense. We have, suppose we have our quantum computer and we have a quantum source and we also have a clock. Now what I do is that I set the timer on the clock and as the clock is running, I feed uh, states row from the quantum source into the quantum computer. And I do this uh, until the clock runs out and the clock rings, at which time I remove the quantum source. And you have a lot of data which is stored in your quantum memory based on whatever processing you, you previously did. And then what I do is I give you the operator O, I, I feed you the operator O and I ask that you output in absolute value, the trace of O against rho. That's the idea. So the question is, how much time do you need to succeed in doing this task? How many copies of rho do you need uh, to, to get in advance so that at the very end of the protocol, you will succeed in doing this with constant probability? So the way you should think about this is that the amount of time that you need or the number of copies of rho that you need um, is contingent on the number of qubits you have. So it turns out that if you have access, if you have two n qubits, a two n qubit quantum computer, and this is an n qubit state row, then the number of cop, the amount of time that you need is logarithmic in n. You need essentially log n copies in order to perform the task successfully, or, or I should say log n time. On the other hand, the interesting thing is that if you have delta less than 2n qubits, in other words, if your quantum computer is not 2n qubits, but it's 2n minus delta qubits, so it's, it's smaller, then the amount of time which is required to achieve this task is lower bounded by an exponential in delta. So what this means is that if you change the amount of space you have, the amount of memory you have linearly, the amount of time which you require increases exponentially. This is in the sense in which this is a space-time trade-off. And it's, I believe, the first of its kind in the context of quantum computation. That if you have less memory, you require much exponentially more time in order to achieve the task. So it's a, so it's a quite dramatic trade-off in that sense. And this experiment, in fact, was done with the Google quantum computer. And um, we have this rigorous lower bound. This is on a log, a log scale, so this is a, a, a plot. And in fact, we see that in the quantum enhanced setting, or that when we have sufficient number of qubits, we can perform the task efficiently. But when we have an insufficient number of qubits, it's, it's, uh, there's this exponential dependence. Let me tell you about one other uh, idea, which is what I'll call replica quantum advantage. So one other idea to pitch to you is the idea of quantum what do we mean by parallel com com uh, computation on a quantum computer? So recall that in the various tasks which I've told you, a lot of the quantum advantage comes in being able to access two copies of a quantum state simultaneously and being able to make joint entangled measurements on those two copies. That's where a lot of the quantum advantage in the previous examples that I have shown you, that's where it comes from. So suppose we want to learn some property of a quantum state row. We could ask, are there any circumstances for which, on the one hand, the property is exponentially hard to learn if we only have access to k copies of row at a time, but that property is easy to learn if we have access to suitably more than k copies of row at a time. So in the k equals one case, this is what I've already told you about. For example, in the purity testing problem, where I either give you a fixed Haar random pure state or I give you a maximally mixed state, if you have two copies of the state, it's easy to de determine which is which by a swap test by just measuring the purity, trace of rho squared. It's a quantity you can perform if you have, uh, you can measure if you have access to two copies of the state simultaneously. That is to say, if you only have one copy of the state at a time, you cannot efficiently learn this property. But if you have two copies of the state at a time, you you, you, you gain an exponential advantage in learning that property. What we might ask is what about k greater than one? Are there examples for which 
if I give you f the properties of a quantum state such that if I give you five copies simultaneously, you cannot efficiently learn the property. But if I give you say six or seven copies, you can, you get an exponential advantage in learning this. It turns out that the answer is yes. In this paper with Chen and uh, Huang and Li, we established that for all K greater than one, there's a hierarchy of these quantum advantages in which, which means that uh, for any K, suppose K is 11, there, there's a property of a, quantum state, of a quantum state such that if I give you 11 copies of the state at a time, you can, it's not efficient to extract that property of the state. But if I give you sufficiently more than 11 copies of the state at a time and you can make a joint entangled measurement, then you can uh, learn that property of the state. So this is to say that there's something, there's a new kind of idea here about how to extract properties of quantum states, which is that there are certain properties of quantum states which are only efficient to extract if you can make entanglement, entangled measurements on sufficiently many copies at once. Let me conclude with the discussion. Let me make some comments about what I see as the quantum enhanced future of experiments. So these results that I've shared demonstrate the power of interfacing quantum data processing with experimental physics and entangling experimental samples to a quantum computer. We've established strong trade-offs between space and time and quantum information processing. And a broader lesson is that there can be immense power in replacing decoherent measurement apparatuses with coherent quantum operations in experimental systems. I believe that further developments of this framework and, and the tools that it provides have the, potential, have the potential to herald new horizons for experimental physics, which I find particularly exciting. Let me make a conceptual point. The usual paradigm of quantum advantage as it's usually advertised is that quantum computers are potentially better than classical computers at, at classical problems. For example, Shor's algorithm with factoring or Grover's algorithm with search. However, what we've talked about here is an idea that you might call quantum learning advantage, in which quantum learning has an advantage over classical learning for learning properties of quantum systems or for performing quantum experiments. This is different. This is not about learning features of classical data, but about learning features of quantum data. And that's where I think a setting in which quantum computing can really shine. So what we've done in summary is we've developed a new framework for proving exponential separations between quantum learning algorithms with and without a quantum memory, namely in the conventional setting and in the quantum enhanced setting. We've established also the first exponential trade-off between bounded quantum memory and query complexity, or as I've said it slightly more fancifully between space and time. And we've established and we've shown a dare, an experimental demonstration of quantum memory advantage in the NISC era namely on this Google Sycamore chip on an existing quantum computer. Now, pertaining to some of the questions which were asked before, it would be interesting to more fully analyze the effects of noise in these kinds of protocols, which kinds of protocols are robust to noise, and in which cases do these large quantum advantages persist in the presence of noise. It would also be desirable to have more physical examples. In other words, the examples which I've provided you with in which there is this large separation are ones for which we can prove these, you know, the, the, their statements that we can prove theorems about. But it would be, but I would like to live in a future, it'd be interesting to live in a future in which an experimentalist could and would want to have a quantum computer in their lab because it would help them with something which they actually would want to do anyway, uh, and not just an, a, an interesting theoretical problem which we can prove theorems about. So I hope that going forward that there will be a way to bridge more realistic and practical problems with the uh, theoretical uh, framework, which uh, I have discussed in this talk. So with that in mind, thank you so much for your attention. And of course, happy to answer any further questions or discussion points that you may have. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jordan, for a great uh, talk. Uh, yes, uh, thanks. We, we have time for uh, questions, comments, discussion. Uh, yes, so maybe if you want to uh, ask a question maybe like you can raise virtually your hand or like if your video okay. please please professor uh, yeah I, I have the following question Damino. your result is impressive uh, very impressive however 
For me, interesting the link to quantum metrology. As one knows, the quantum complexity of experiment involves this metrological properties of the states, yes? That's uh, right. Yeah, where, uh, where, in particular, entanglement play a specific role, you know, yes? For example, there is a quantum metrology based set of dynamic uh, features of, of uh, status. Yes. Well, it, my, my question is, what do you mean if will be possible to extend this the task your task uh, to uh, to the metrological task uh, uh, some optimization yes of of, of yeah. experiment uh, for me there's a very interesting will be very interesting link yes because no, in fact <laughs> this is very natural to think about metrology yes, in this context it is my question. Yeah, so I have thought about, so a lot of the advantages in quantum metrology are often quadratic or you know, some small polynomial. And something that I've been actively thinking about is how to uh, use some of the techniques in this talk, as you said, to, say, to make new statements about quantum metrology. And maybe what I can say for now is, um, it's a point that I think was uh, inherent, which was, baked into your question, which is that the way that we, in these theorems that I shared, get these large advantages is by figuring out what are, is by thinking hard about what are properties of a, of a quantum state that are particularly hard to learn uh, unless you can do full quantum information processing. And the short answer about interfacing with quantum metrology is finding out an interesting property that you would want to measure using quantum metrology, um, which is not the ones that people usually think about because the ones that people usually think about have sort of smaller advantages and figuring out what that would be such that you can use these techniques. So it's a bit, as we would say, like a Jeopardy question. It's, you know, it's like, uh, you, you, you know, we, you, you have to find, uh, you know, the right question, you know, you have to find the question which gives you the answer for which you have a huge advantage. And exactly what those properties are is somewhat suggestive by what I've said in the talks. Properties of symmetries, for example, are something which can be hard to learn. Uh, properties of certain things about dynamics and about dynamical chaos, about, you know, um, so those kinds of things, I, I think, uh, have a bright future in terms of interfacing these ideas of quantum metrology, but I, I can't yet, I, I don't yet have a, 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 a particular answer to the question. It, it's not fully developed yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Vera. Thanks. Um, other questions to Jordan? Uh, uh, Shunji? Yes. Um, uh, uh, thank you for the very, very interesting talk. Um, so uh, could you comment about, um, like, uh, if I want to use uh, quantum machine learning, so there is a story of a dequantization. And uh, so uh, now, uh, if you, if you want to study a uh, user quantum uh, machine learning, uh, like uh, which direction should we go? Um. Well, so um, how do I say? So let me be careful about what we mean by quantum machine learning. Let me distinguish mm -hmm. between two different possibilities. So a lot of the ideas in here, maybe I'll substitute so we can all. Uh, talk, I can always, I can always reshare if we want to look at the slides. Um, so the kind of learning that we have discussed here is in the following context. It's in the context of um, making interesting quantum measurements and then doing learning, classical learning theory on the data that you get in doing so. In the context of say shadow tomography, I don't know if you're familiar with that, this allows interesting ways of making quantum measurements, which the classical data that you get contains a lot of interesting information about the quantum states. You can try to learn properties of the quantum states by doing classical learning theory on the, uh, on, on the data that you got from the quantum experiments. That is something, that framework is very much integrated into these results. It, it, mm -hmm. It's very closely connected. And in fact, the, many of the results use that and also inform how to do that. There's a different kind of question though, uh, which is a trickier question in which, um, by quantum machine learning, you might also mean that you also learn what quantum circuit you want to do. So in other words, you don't just make a fixed randomized measurement and do, do learning theory, classical learning theory on the, on 
on the data that you get thereafter, you actually learn the quantum operations that you want to do on the system. Mm -hmm. That's sort of, that's another form of quantum machine learning. And that I think is a, a more difficult set of questions because um, it's not well characterized what kinds of variational circuits you can and cannot learn. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, I, th that's just a problem which is currently on the frontiers of what we know how to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. But, uh, but anyway, the short of it is that I think that many of these techniques here will be useful for that question as well. But mm -hmm. I think that the, the, the contemporary question, which is already useful, which we already did in the experiments, is you make quantum measurements and then you do learning. Um, you, you know, you, how do I say? You apply the techniques of learning theory to the, to, to, for the post-processing. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thanks. More questions or comments? Okay, I have one. So you mentioned in the discussion part about the effects of, of noise. So let's say, uh, like, can you comment like about robustness of those especially exponential separations when you have, let's say, the simplest like local noise, not even in gates, but in the measurements themselves, like, you know, uh, some uh, you know bit flip error on a upon readout, right? So does it uh, is like what's uh, what's happening then, like with this separation? Yeah. So the the short answer is okay. So naively, uh, many of these swap test like protocols uh, are inefficient when you have no. I mean, they you just can't do them when you have noise. It, it basically uh, degrades them. But some of the more complicated protocols that we have, for example, the ones that we did with the Google device, if you look at the data as you get noisier and noisier and noisier, which I didn't quite show you what it looks like, it looks like the advantage actually becomes uh, polynomial as opposed to exponential. Like it's like a large polynomial advantage, which is still quite nice, where the exponent of the polynomial depends on the noise threshold and you know, how much noise you have. And, um, so that's very suggestive. And I believe that one of my collaborators, Robert Wong, has some results in progress in which that can be made rigorous. So what I would anticipate the general story is, is that in the presence of noise, okay, so let me make two comments. One, in the presence of noise, I believe that many of these exponential separations will just become large polynomial separations, which is still quite useful. Um, but the basic problem just as a conceptual, and, and, and Robert will have more to say about that at some point. Um, but um, the, the problem, I think, which is an interesting conceptual question, which I'd like to emphasize, because I kind of like this question, is you know, you can't do error correction on an experimental system, at least the most direct way. Nature, if you have you know, a superconductor or gra graphene, it's not error corrected, uh -huh, at least not naturally. So if you want to transduce some of the data from a physical system into a quantum computer, you have to figure out how to do it in a way which can deal with the noise because, or figure out how to um, encode in some air correctable way, some of the properties of it in, in some rapid manner before you end up degrading the features of the system you want. So I think there's an interesting conceptual set of questions that was brought up by this work which is how do you deal with experimental systems when you can't really do error correction? Either it could be the case that there are some properties of the quantum system which are intrinsically error corrected. Uh, if you ever play around with tensor networks and the connections to the renormalization group, you notice that there are certain properties of quantum states that are already robust to error. That's a, that seems like an interesting avenue to think about. Or you can think about if there are properties which are not robust to error, how do you sort of use some of the techniques of error correction to so that you can make whatever protocol you're doing as robust to noise as possible, even though you can't do full-fledged error correction. So I think that's a very interesting set of questions for future discussion, the hard set of questions, but I think it's extremely experimentally relevant. Thanks. Uh, more questions or comments? Uh, um, okay, so I, I have one, maybe, uh, I mean, uh, like, could you share a bit more details about those experiments on, on Google Syncam or Chip? So I'm sort of uh, interested, like a bit in like in practice. So I understand that you do kind of coherent measurements on two copies or three copies. I don't know what were those. Two, yeah. Like, 
just in like what was the gist of those like uh, experiments exactly yeah so so maybe let me say a word about um uh uh, let me just give one example because there's, there's a lot more details. So it just depends how in the weeds we want to get. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you one of the interesting examples. So let's talk about this case where you want to distinguish between, um, you know, uh, how do I say, a unitary, a low depth. Unitary. and unitary. Yeah, great. Let's distinguish between that. So if you have two replicas of the system, then there is a protocol that's completely, uh, you know, that you can write down. It's like a spot test type protocol, which will distinguish between the two possibilities. But you can do something else, which we did, which is sort of fun, which is that you prepare two copies and then you do shadow tomography, you make randomized measurements, and then you store that classical data. Or you do that on only a single replica. The single replica is like the conventional experiment, the two replicas is like the quantum experiment. So you just do classical shadow tomography and you get this data. Now what you do is you take th these two pieces of classical data and you run them through unsupervised clustering algorithms. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what you saw. So what was interesting was that by just doing kind of this type of classical shadow tomography on two replicas and running it through an unsupervised clustering algorithm, it actually saw that there were two different clusters, which in fact corresponded to the two kinds of data. But in the one replica case, it could not do so. It, 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 this unsupervised method just doesn't work. I mean, the, which is what you would expect by the results that I shared. But it's just interesting that the, even the unsupervised machine learning algorithm could distinguish between the two possibilities given this kind of relatively simple entangled measurement data between the two copies. Uh, so, sure. yeah. so, so we didn't tell it that it should tell the difference between you know, the unitary and the orthogonal case for the data I showed you. We just said, okay, here's some data on two replicas, some entangled measurements, uh, decide for yourself how, you know, if these things cluster and, and it did. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's I'm not sure if those ex results exist I mean, maybe like, but, but of course, it's conceivable to to extend shadow tomography to when you have coherent kind of copies, right? And I'm, I'm not sure if it was developed in the original paper, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, um, probably it's like. Uh, yeah, I mean, there there are papers which discuss how to do to shadow tomography on replicas, but the thing which is important for this is that the type of shadow. I mean how do I say you have to it's a type of shadow tomography in which you have to make uh you know entangle you know you make a bunch of random bell measurements between the two copies like you have to couple the two copies or it's uh it's not gonna sure, sure, sure. I mean like if you do okay yeah. sorry for people like you if you do like global cleavers or something you would like pro but probably you cannot do on, on the, like if you do global cleavers you'll be able to estimate like a swap or any sort of property like this. but the way you should think about it is that you know you you entangle these two things with some low depth circuit and then you sure, make some sure. measurement. But the interesting thing is that I think it's suggestive and highly interesting that even at the level of the data you get by doing that form of two replica shadow tomography, that's sufficient for an unsupervised le classical learning algorithm to determine some interesting quantum feature of the state. I think that's quite surprising. I mean, maybe it's not surprising, but it's, 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 it's very neat. <laughs> sure, sure, nice. All right. I mean, I, I do have some technical questions, but I don't want to maybe bore the, I don't know, <laughs> take over like, like maybe somebody, somebody else has questions or comments to Jordan. Uh, yeah. Mm. So, uh, right. Mm. Okay, I ju just maybe one last uh, question. So, uh, like, uh, can you just briefly comment? Because in some of your results, you assumed how random that, let's say, states or unitaries are how random. Like, what happens like when you do when you have let's say those objects taken like from designs or approximate designs? So uh, I, I would understand that to some extent results would um, some of the results would prevail. Uh, yeah. So, uh, well, yeah. Some of the results do prevail with k-designs, uh, it's true. Uh, we could talk in more detail maybe at some future time because it's a little in the weeds which ones do and which ones don't. But um, many of the results also work maybe in a slightly weakened form if you have pseudo-random quantum states. Of course, that involves a computational complexity theoretic assumption. Unfortunately, by the way, there, as far as I know, there is no example of pseudo-random are ran pseudo random unitaries. There's only a construction for pseudo random states. But if there was 
a putative construction for pseudo-random states under plausible complexity theoretic conjectures, then you could easily interface that with these results. But the answer is some fraction of the results, in fact, are fine with the K designs. In fact, uh, let me just say, not the purity testing result, but for example, these, I should just advertise that this result of this like K replica quantum advantage that I said at the end, that is constructed with certain kinds of K designs. <laughs> uh, so, um, so K designs are already baked into that problem. For the purity testing problem, the one case in which we've established a, uh, the K design is sort of not strong enough for that problem, but pseudo random states are roughly strong enough to get a huge advantage. And th th those are states which are efficiently preparable, but which conjecturally are any polynomial depth circuit cannot distinguish copies of this thing from the hard random state, mm -hmm. from a fixed hard random state. Anyway, uh, so that's the short answer. So, so the answer is sort of yes, no, it depends on the. <laughs> sure, sure. Thanks, Jordan. Okay, last, uh, maybe last chance to ask something to our speaker. Um, uh, okay, if, if not, let's, let's thank him again for amazing talk and great discussion. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, it was great to have you. All right, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.